So I'm a pediatric endocrinologist. Um, I'm an associate professor of pediatrics at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. I see patients in our general endocrine and diabetes clinics, but I also direct a multidisciplinary prader willi syndrome uh, clinic, and we take care of patients of all ages, um, adults and pediatric patients that uh, have prader willi syndrome. And we've got a pretty large group. We've got about 150 patients that have uh, come through our clinic. So prader willi syndrome is a genetic disorder. Um, it's one of our more common rare diseases. So around one in 15,000 uh, babies are, are diagnosed with prader willi syndrome. Patients are usually diagnosed because they are born with really low muscle tone. So um, a lot of times in the newborn nursery, uh, physicians will notice that the baby is kind of floppy, having trouble eating, and that leads to further testing and often the diagnosis of prader willi syndrome. When the children are really young, they actually struggle a lot with, with eating and with um, developmental milestones. And so they need a lot of therapy to, to gain those skills. And the more classic features of that increased weight gain, increased hunger, actually don't happen until kids are older. So the average age that children start to develop that really increased hunger, where they're just constantly thinking about food, um, really seeking food, you know, sometimes doing in, what we consider, you know, inappropriate or, or unusual behaviors because they have such a drive to eat food. We don't see that start uh, typically until around later elementary school, like eight, nine, 10 years old. So right now we um, only have what, had one treatment that was uh, particularly indicated for Prader-Willi syndrome, and that is growth hormone. So we would start growth hormone in the first year of life. That has been shown to help both with muscle tone and, and development, but also actually their, their cognitive development, so intellectual gains. So we, we try to start that as, as early as we can, uh, but it doesn't prevent the increased hunger and the weight gain that we see as kids get older. Otherwise, we treat the comorbidities. So a lot of children have difficulties with um, normal hormone function and may require some hormone replacements, as well as sleep apnea and sometimes some psychiatric um, issues that would require medication. But the only thing that was really specific to PWS was the use of growth hormone. Yeah, so this is the first drug that we've had that's really targeting that increase in hunger. Um, and it's a really important symptom because it's the reason most of our patients require 24 hour a day, seven day a week uh, supervision and care. Um, so we don't have patients that are living independently or working independently because that hunger drive is so strong, they struggle um, without supervision to, to operate in just kind of the regular world where, where food tends to be everywhere. And so this is the first drug that's targeting that. The idea is that it's helping to decrease um, release of some hormones in the brain that lead to the, the pathways that cause this increase in, in hunger and, and decrease in energy expenditure, how many calories your body is, is burning. I'll be really honest, we don't entirely understand why patients with PWS develop such strong hunger and hyperphagia. Um, and we really don't understand what changes over time, why they start out without those symptoms and then they develop as they get older. So we have ideas of how of how this new drug works, um, but since we don't entirely understand the mechanism in PWS, other than we think something goes wrong with an area of the brain called the hypothalamus, uh, it's a, a little premature to say that we definitely understand how the drug is working as well. So it was a little bit of an unusual phase three program. The original study was a pretty typical a randomized placebo controlled um, clinical trial where they looked at changes in hyperphagia questionnaires. So a subjective questionnaire completed by caregivers, typically a parent, over about 12 weeks. The problem is that original phase three study took place uh, right before and during the COVID shutdown. So we had real changes in behavior and kind of life for our patients with PWS during COVID. For some patients, uh, it was actually a really great time. The families were all home together. There was a lot of structure. They were walking five miles a day. They were, you know, cooking all their meals and, and really careful about you know, what foods were around. And so we had some of our patients that thrived during, during the um, 
shut down. And then we had other families where the child was no longer going to school. The family members were still having to work. There was decreased supervision and things really were, were more difficult for the patient during that time. So the problem was we were in the middle of a phase three trial and all of a sudden we had the situation where our patients were gaining or losing weight completely unrelated to what treatment they'd been assigned to, whether they were in the placebo group or the treatment group. So that, that study was very hard to interpret results. And when they looked at the data from pre-March of 2020, it looked like the the treatment was effective. The groups were separating. The patients on on drug were having lower hyperphagia scores than patients on placebo. And then the data got really messy. So the patients were given the option to stay on an open-label extension trial. And we had a lot of patients that just continued to take the treatment drug um, for several years uh, while the company, you know, looked at data, talked with the FDA. And what ended up being decided is that we needed another phase three trial. Um, But the FDA, I think really kindly, but really just sort of pragmatically said that um, we didn't have to go and enroll an entirely new group of patients. This is a rare disease. It's also a disease that's had a lot of clinical trials over the past decade and nothing make it to market. So there's been some real fatigue for our families who've participated in a lot of clinical trials. And it's a, it's a pretty burdensome thing to do. So they, what, what we ended up doing as the second phase three trial is rather than doing a whole new new group of patients, re-randomizing, they took the patients who'd been on the open label extension trial and actually did what's called a randomized withdrawal phase. So patients were re-randomized to either stay on the medicine that they'd been on at this point for several years or to go back onto placebo. And then patients were followed for 16 weeks and we looked to see if patients worsened. Um, If they were randomized back to placebo, did their scores start to go up? Did they not do as well? And that's what we found that at the end of 16 weeks, there was a significant difference in um, hyperphagia questionnaire scores between placebo and uh, the treatment group. We also found that the weight differences started to happen. So there was um, an increase in BMI for the patients who were randomized back to placebo. So it did look like there was a nice drug effect. um, And then after 16 weeks, we were able to get everyone back on the the drug. Uh, Really thankful for the patients who were willing to, you know, have this potential placebo period twice um, during their time on this study. This is the first drug we've had um, that's ever been targeting and approved for treatment of hyperphagia. So it's a really interesting and um, exciting new tool uh, that we now have an ability to try to treat our patients rather than right now where all we do is try to change the environment around them. Um, So we're not really treating their symptoms. We're just trying to minimize their access to food, um, the temptation to, you know, to eat food outside of their meal times, but we're not helping with the symptoms. Um, And so these patients have been, you know, really struggling and having significant distress uh, every day. And this is the first time that we've had um, an intervention that can try to actually fix the underlying problem and decrease that level of hyperphagia, which hopefully is going to make it a lot easier for our families. So um, really, really hope that physicians will take the time to learn about the new drug. Uh, it's definitely a, something that we've, we've never had um, anything like this before. So it'll, it'll take us a little time to get, you know, figure out the right patients to use it for, to assess response. Um, And the other thing I'd like to point out is the drug is not super fast acting. So it really did take about 16 weeks to see that difference in behavior. And it took about six months to get patients to a a steady state. Uh, So we're going to have to be a bit patient to see how patients respond to this new medication. 